We're going to turn to God's word of the week here at this point in our worship service uh, as we value God's, God's word here at Grace Community Church. Now, there are these unique moments. You, you already heard that I suffer from foot and, foot and mouth syndrome as a pastor. I also under, uh, suffer from senior moments as a senior pastor, okay? And so one of my senior moments is I, I, I don't have my Bible, with me at this moment. So Grace, is my Bible over there underneath the, the chair at the end? Is it possible? Is it, it's, it's not there? Okay. Well, my Bible may be, may be missing, so I'm going to need to borrow uh, the ESV. Thank you, brother. Thank you. God is good. I tell you what. We're here about Jesus because we're broken people, and we need Jesus, and your pastor's really messed up, and he needs Jesus too. So we just love Jesus here at Grace Community. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's right. All right. So we have God's Word of the Week as a reminder of uh, uh, reflecting on His Word, memorizing it. So does anybody uh, want to uh, recite God's Word of the Week here this week? Oh, we got a competition between Dean and, and, and Marge. I think, Marge, you did the last one. So uh, Dean will let you do this one here, brother. Amen. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Uh, as Dean is quoting from Colossians there, we've been going through a sermon series in the book of Colossians, uh, exploring the, the, the beauty, the greatness of Jesus, the majesty of Jesus. Paul's trying to expand, explode our vision, our perception that Jesus is bigger, he's greater than what we can conceive. My Bible. Thank you, brother. Lord Jesus, is, he's so good. He's so good. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. My brother, Jason, Jeremy, sorry. Bob, thank you. <laughs> I'm just displaying all my frailty and humanity before you all today. <laughs> Here we go. We are, we're walking through Colossians because Jesus is bigger and greater. Our focus on him, we need him. And so today's passage that we're going to be preaching through is Colossians 2, chapter uh, 2, thank you, verse 11 through 15. So again, Colossians 2, 11 through 15, you can turn there in your Bible, Bible app. Uh, we have Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you. So as you're turning there here, I, 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 need, a, I need a couple volunteers, a couple kiddos here. Uh, you can kind of stand up where you're at if you will, but I need some, I need some help with a couple questions here. What are some of the signs of that somebody's living, that a person is alive and not dead. All right, I need some help from you kiddos. What are some signs of life that a person is alive and not dead? Okay, they're breathing. Okay. What was that back there? They're moving. Yep. Excellent. What else? Any other signs of life? The color of their skin. Their arms are moving. Anything else might be a sign of life. They're warm. Yeah. It's a sign their blood is flowing. And what's, what else is pumping in their, their heart's pumping? Yeah. You can get a heartbeat. Yeah. There's all kinds of signs, right, if a person's alive. So, but what if, what if, the, person, what if the person has a big old tattoo on their arm that says, I'm alive? Does that mean that they're alive? No, no, no. But what if they're sitting up, they're like in a chair, and they got their clothes, their eyes are open, and they got clothes on and everything, it kind of looks, what if that, does that mean they're alive? No, no. So they might have like all kinds of different things that look like they're alive, but there's some real signs, true signs that they're alive, like breathing, and they're warm, the color of their skin, their heart's beating, okay. Well, as Christians... There are signs of spiritual life, that we are alive. Do you know, is your life showing that you're alive? Is there signs of life in you? Let's jump to the word here. Colossians 2, verses 11 through 15. 
In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by the canceling of the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we receive God's word. Lord Jesus, we, we come to you now <clears throat> asking to send your spirit Holy Spirit, we, we need you to open our hearts and our minds to your word, that your truth would have its desired effect, and that's not that we would just know more, but that we would know you more, and in knowing you, we are changed. There is obedience. There is beliefs. In truth, Lord God, that... that, that have implications to radically change our lives, and we want to let you work that in us today. And Lord God, I pray, I need you desperately as your servant, as your broken servant. Speak through me. I speak your truth, Lord God, to get out of your way. In your name we pray. Amen. Last week, we heard from Van Den Crouch as he preached in the previous verses, starting in verse 8, where Paul is addressing that there is philosophies, there, there are uh, is teachings that are bombarding the pe people at Colossae, the believers in this rural town. And he describes them as empty deceit based on human tradition and the elemental traditions of the world, empty deceit and lies, that by, by pursuing these things and, and trying to find fullness in these things, and these, these lies, these philosophies were claiming that they had the full truth, that you would have full life in believing in these things and following these things, but it's empty lies is what Paul says, and he transitions to focus as he's done throughout this book, it's Jesus is where the power is. Jesus is where the fullness is. He explains that the fullness of God, all of God is in Jesus, and Jesus is in us, filling us. We have all that we need for that full, transformed life in Jesus Christ alone. We've been walking through that in the sermon series. How do we live life being in Jesus, letting Jesus live himself in and through us. So Paul continues with addressing this, this emptiness, this empty deceit with the fullness of Christ. What do we have in Jesus Christ? And that's where he continues on in the passage that we have for today. Next week, he's going to unpack the detail of all these empty lies and philosophies that the, the, the people, uh, uh, the deceivers in Colossae were communicating to the people. Today, we're pursuing more of what we have in Jesus Christ. That is life, new life. So he starts off with this passage talking about circumcision, and then he moves on to baptism, and what he's trying to get out is there's a sign, the sign of new life, a symbol of new life for us as believers is union with Christ in his death and resurrection through baptism. So if you're a person, a filler in the blanker, all right? If you like to fill in the blanks, here's, uh, here's the main point here, the first part of our passage. So Paul starts off here, in him you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Okay, circumcision. Some of us may, may know what this is, some of us may not have a clue what this is, and some of us may be going, why is this even here? Why are we talking about circumcision in the Bible? Let's go back. we got to go back a little bit, get some context to understand why is circumcision such a big deal in the Scriptures. 
we got to go back all the way to Genesis chapter 17, where God is talking with Abraham, and he has communicated he's chosen Abraham. Through him and all his descendants, he would save all of the world. Through him, Jesus would come thousands of years later to bring about salvation for all people. In order to be God's people, in order to be the people of promise, they entered into what was called a covenant. God made a promise with Abraham that he was going to, that they would be his people. He would bless them and protect them, and he would save the world through them. On the other side of that was the promise of Abraham to receive this gift from God and to remain as God's people. This covenant came in of receiving God's choosing, his gracious choosing, by the act of covenant, making a promise, entering into, promise, enter, entering into a promise. Now, this promise wasn't just to be a, a, a symbol, but it was to be something that was lived out in the hearts of the people. And God gave a specific symbol of that promise, circumcision. Now, we might go like, for those of us who understand what circumcision is, it's the cutting of the foreskin of male genitalia. And we're going to go, what in the world is going on? Why would this be God's symbol of covenant and promise? Well, we have to understand this came in a historical context. Circumcision wasn't something that was limited only to the Israelite people. Okay? It wasn't something special and exclusive to them at that time. It preexisted the Israelite people. It existed among the Egyptians surrounding people that would eat in the areas where they would even uh, uh, claim the promised land, like Canaanites, for example, they were also, also practiced circumcision. It was not an uncommon thing. But what was different is how God called Israel to utilize this practice for, in order to, to express a particular meaning. You see, among these other cultures, it was a rite of passage. It was something to, that, that, that young men would do as coming of age to express their manhood and stepping out of being a boy and into becoming a man, and they would go through circumcision. Other cultures, it might be for fertility or sacrifice to God, but oftentimes it was the case was it was the, the rite of passage during puberty. Well, the interesting thing that God has, the Israelites practice, is when, for those of you Old Testament scholars in the house, when is uh, circumcision to be practiced? At the eighth day, as a baby. As a baby. This is unique. Why might this be unique? Why, 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 what kind of meaning might this have? It, because it's something that is done to the child. They, 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 it's not something that they're doing to prove themselves. But it's something this helpless child is receiving as an act of God's grace. God's gracious and divine choosing of his people. His showing his favor. In addition, why in the world would God choose a sign that includes the cutting of the foreskin of male genitalia? What in the world? Why, why, why would he continue to, to practice this and not move on to something else and create something altogether different? You see, in the culture at that day and time, to mark such an intimate part of the body was to be such an intimate reminder of the extent to which the personal commitment would go in the lives of the people. That they are to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. The marking of such an intimate part of their body was to indicate the intimacy of this personal commitment in the lives of the people. But why males then? Why only males? Praise God, it's not for females. But why males? Because in that culture in that time, circum uh, uh, headship was important coming through men, so it was an expression of the, the, the head of the home, and the, and the expression of the head of the home covered the entire home. The commitment the values, the beliefs of the head of the home would cover the entire home. And that's why it was important that males were circumcised in that understanding of headship. Male babies were circumcised to describe, to, to exhibit the covenant of God's gracious choosing of his people, 
showing his personal favor, to mark them that the intimacy of their response to his gracious choosing would, would, would reach deeply into their, their hearts to love him with everything that they have, and that their whole lives, their homes and families would be covered with such a love. <clears throat> we come, now let's move forward to this passage that we have today. This circumcision, this sign of commitment, of, of, of covenant in relationship with God, of receiving his grace, is changed. It's something different now. Thank God. But at that time, some of these influencers were saying, you have to be circumcised in order to receive and experience the fullness of God. There was the pressure that you had to go through this ritual for other nations who didn't practice this. And Paul's going to make the point that that is not where the fullness of God comes from. There is a new sign that represents the work of Jesus, and our fullness is in Jesus. So let's walk through here. You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. What does this mean? This is a, a, a work of God. It's not done by hands. It's not done by human beings. This is a work of God. By his grace on our hearts, our hearts are changed. Not something external, not like a tattoo, like we talked about, a tattoo that says I'm alive doesn't indicate that we're alive. No, there's got to be a regeneration, a resurrection that happens in our hearts and our lives. This is a circumcision done without hands by God that only God could do. By putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. What that means is that in our heart change, that he's changed our allegiances, that we're no longer participate, we're no longer in promise with and in covenant with and committed to the things of the past, this world, ourself. No, it's changed. We're committed to Jesus Christ. Which is only something God could do. He goes on to describe this. How does this happen? Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him. Baptism is that sign, if you will, a symbol now pointing to Jesus. It points to something, an inward reality, a true reality that we have, we have joined with Jesus in his death and resurrection. What is his is ours. That language of with in this passage is so important that we now associate ourselves, we've given ourselves to Jesus so that now whatever is his is ours. And it first starts with death. Death in which we die to sin. We die to selfishness. We die to ourselves. Which is followed by resurrection life. Where we are new and have a new identity. Where we live for Jesus. So this truth, this reality, means that there's a heart beating now. Where before, where we were dead, there was, what that means for us is that our heart did not beat for God. We didn't love him. We loved ourselves. Anything else but Jesus, but God. But now our hearts begin to beat again. We have that blood throwing through, through our veins. Signs of life that we love Jesus and want to obey him, want to follow him. We trust him alone. Paul finishes this point of, of, of baptism is the sign that circumcision was by saying this, that it's through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. This faith is indicative that it's not baptism that the ritual somehow gives us life. It's faith in the work of Jesus Christ that gives us life. It's Jesus himself. It's where do we put that focus? You see, the, 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 the deceivers, the liars of that time were focusing on tradition, on what you have to do to earn God's power and favor. And the difference is, it's not about what we do. It's what Jesus has done for us. And trusting in his work for you and me that makes us alive, that changes us and transforms us. And baptism is that expression 
of what is his is mine now. And maybe this might be a time to stir you up, some of you, in considering, have you been baptized? Have you expressed that in Jesus? Sign of God's gracious choosing and the commitment of God's people is not intended to be a physical sign, but a heart commitment. That's expressed by faith. Who or what are you trusting in? The rituals in your life or Jesus Christ and the work that he's done? That's first and foremost. Carrying the sign of Jesus. Next we move in the passage here and see that God has made us alive. And there's two things that he's done to make us alive. Sealed us with forgiveness and delivered us from spiritual oppression. So let's look at this here in verse 13. And you were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Paul explains here, we were dead before, as they talked about. And what that dead, that death means, that deadness of our heart means our heart was not beating for Jesus. What was holding us imprisoned in death is sin in our hearts that had to be dealt with. The dead of sin. But also, he talks about next in verse 15, that there are spiritual authorities and powers that were also holding us, oppressing us with the power of death. So God making us alive, he did two things through Jesus Christ, which we'll focus on. We'll focus on the first part of that is the forgiveness that he accomplishes for us by canceling the legal debt, the legal demands against us that it says here. We've all sinned, all of us. There's no one who is righteous as the scriptures proclaim. The ten, if you just look at the Ten Commandments, have we, any of us, lied? Raise your hand if you've lied, ever. If you're not raising your hand, you're a liar, okay? That's my, that's my low-hanging fruit. I always call upon that one because I can get you. No, but, but if we walk through the Ten Commandments, have we ever expressed jealousy? Have we ever experienced jealousy in our hearts and our lives? All of us have. All of us have. Has there been any form of adultery? Well, Jesus explained that if you lust in your heart, there's adultery there. Many and most of us have. Has there been anger in our hearts towards someone, bitterness in our hearts towards someone? We may not have murdered someone, but there's been anger or bitterness. Yeah, we've all been there too. We sin unconsciously, friends, throughout the day. Our sin is like the national debt. It's climbing constantly. As of right now, it's $21 trillion, $208 billion. I was going to give them millions, but it's just moving through it too fast. It's escalating. It's crazy how fast the debt is growing. This is our sin. But I don't know what you guys, but I ain't got $21 trillion. Anybody got $21 trillion? You can pay that debt, Ryan? Yeah, in your dreams, bro, right? In your dreams. Bitcoin maybe, I don't know. We can't pay that debt, friends. None of us can. You see, back in the, uh, Jesus' day, there was this thing called debtor's prison. Jesus alludes to this in the Gospel of Matthew. And if you had debt that you owed, you couldn't pay it back, you'd be sent into debtor's prison where somebody maybe could pay it for you or you, you might work it off. You don't want to go to debtor's prison because you might not come back with all the same body parts. Be tortured. There was at some points I was reading through this, the extent of Roman uh, practices. They could, there was a point of, of you could pay with body parts, legs, arms, yep, it was a bad place. You did not want to go to debtor's prison. You didn't want to go to prison at all. Romans were notorious for enjoying the pleasure of pain in others. We're all, we're all headed to debtor's prison for help because of our sin. We owe a debt we none of us can pay. And, and, and in the practice at this day and time, what could happen is if there was some benefactor in your life or, or family member who could cover the, the, the debt that you owed, if that debt was paid, because you couldn't pay it yourself, then they would come to that prison cell 
and on the, on, on the, on the, the, the braces that held up the cell, they would nail to the, to the posts a statement that said, paid in full. Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to the cross for you and me. It wasn't just our sin that was nailed there, that held him there. It was our sin that was actually nailed there. Jesus took all our sin on him. And on the cross, him hanging there is the symbol, is the note on the prison cell for us saying, paid in full. The gates open. You and I are free. Paid in full. We are forgiven through Jesus. All of it. All of it. Through his suffering in hell that he took in our place. Friends, you no longer have to live strangled by guilt or shame. You don't have to hide because it's, it's forgiven. Your sin, whatever it is, when you come to Jesus Christ, when you accept his work for you, when you accept him to be Lord of your life and return to him, it's paid in full, all of it. It's not, a, it's not a license for us to go forward and do whatever we want, but whatever sin that goes forward, his blood covers it still. His payment on the cross, that message, doesn't somehow get pulled down. It stays and remains. He's covering you, even now, paid in full. If your heart, though, is filled with pride, you won't think see this as a significant thing. You'll just walk on by. This will be just a, a, a minor thing, a sense of entitlement, if you will, that, that, that God loves me, and so he should pay the, my penalty for me. Do, do we understand how wrong that is? In pride, the significance of our forgiveness will just be overlooked and overshadowed, but, but in humility, if we see and understand Jesus paid a debt we could never pay, and we deserve that debtor's prison of torment for eternity. There's joy. There's freedom. There's humility. There's no shame. We can confess our sin without fear, with no need to hide anymore because it's paid in full. There's no retribution. There's nothing to be paid anymore because we're forgiven. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just forgiveness. You see, it opens, it opens the gate of the prison. But there's tormentors. There's the prison guards, the torturers that have yet to be dealt with. In verse 15, he says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities, putting them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. What does it mean that he just disarmed these rulers and authorities? You see, our sin, when we sin when, through Adam... It gave Satan power and authority over our lives to, to, to torment and torture us, to oppress us, to manipulate us. Ever since creation, they have power in our lives. And so he, Satan has power, and, and there's demonic oppression that has power to manipulate us through fear, to live for this moment, to live for ourselves. Excuse me, he, he manipulates us with a sense of hopelessness. With helplessness, he uses pride and shame in our lives. Powerful tools to keep us controlled. But these powers that have authority, have, have, have authority over us have been disarmed. That means there is no power that they have if we're in Jesus. The irony here is that while Satan believed, while, while it is the nature and character of the enemy to triumph through shame, it was through the shame of the cross that Christ was victorious. 
The irony is, is that Jesus used his very tools and his very tricks in order to demonstrate that Satan had lost his power and authority altogether. I, I like the story, as, as, I, as I was thinking through this and preparing the, the, the story of the emperor and his new clothes. Many of you remember the story of the emperor's new clothes. The emperor uh, oh, is this vain, vain uh, 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 a ruler who, who uh, uh, was wanted the best the best attire, he was gonna. He was gonna uh, go in procession through the town in his his new attire. Can you turn me down just a little bit? Um, going through procession with his new attire, and he had these. He was looking for these special people to to make this these clothes for him that were just the best ever. And there was these crooks who were there who who uh, took advantage of his of his uh, simplicity of his vanity. And they told him they had this, this, this new thing, this magical clothes that, that he would wear, make him the most the, the grandest king and emperor of all. And, and, and when he put them on and, and, and went to prance through the town in procession, what, what was displayed was that he was merely naked. He didn't have any clothes on at all. It was his shame going through town believing that he had this special, beautiful, wonderful uh, attire that was the greatest thing ever. Prancing in, in, in triumph, if you will. But he was naked. He was naked. And he walked in his shame before all people. As the enemy, as the powers of evil, took Christ on the cross, stripped him naked sought to, to, to publicly shame him through the cross and the whippings and the beatings and demonstrating power over him. It was in that apparent powerlessness. It was in his apparent shame that he was declaring victory over Satan. He was derobing, dethroning, showing the nakedness of Satan. Of all authorities and powers in the cross, Friends, Jesus triumphing through the cross, through his death in our place, means that you are not helpless. It means that the darkness in your life does not have to control or dictate who you are, how you live, and the joy that you can have. It does not mean that you have, it means that you no longer have to hide. It means that you are victorious. You can say no. You see, these things, these struggles in your life, where you felt the power that you can't help but give in, that you are free to say no and yes to Jesus. You can renounce the power and authority that Satan has claimed over your life. Are you alive? Are you alive? Is there signs of life in you that you have been made alive? Is there evidence that you are forgiven? If we have been made alive in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are set free. Is that present in your life? The sign of baptism, that we are dead with Christ, we died with him to sin, we are alive together with him, is that present in you? Hope, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. Is that alive in you? If that's not, let's seek some prayer. Come and seek the Lord today. As we go to communion here this morning, as we express our union with Christ in His death and resurrection, in His body and His blood, we express we take hold of the work of Jesus for us. We're free. We're forgiven. We can live in such a way. Let me pray here as we transition now to our time of communion. Father God, I pray for my friends, Lord Jesus. I pray for myself, Lord God, that we would take hold of this truth, this reality. We are alive in you. Lord, the gracious work that you have done in us, that you have, you have changed our hearts, you've caused us to become alive, our hearts to beat for you. 
You've opened the prison cell. You've paid our debt in full. You've removed the power of our tormentors. We don't have to give in to them. We don't have to listen to them anymore. We are more than conquerors through you, Jesus. Lord God, we pray that we would believe this, that we would act on this, that we would live this, God, today. And Lord God, as we, as we move into communion now, Lord God, to take hold of your body and blood that accomplished this for us. Lord God, I pray that this reflection, this time of reflection, would allow us to let these truths sink deep and to get a hold of us, Lord God, for your glory. In your name we pray.